Hello, friends. Welcome to Vogue Audiobooks. The Confessions of Arsène Lupin Chapter 2 The Wedding Ring Yvonne Dorigny kissed her son and told him to be good. You know your grandmother Dorigny is not very fond of children. Now that she has sent for you to come and see her, you must show her what a sensible little boy you are. And turning to the governess, don't forget, Fraulein, to bring him home immediately after dinner. Is Monsieur still in the house? Yes, Madame. Monsieur le Comte is in his study. As soon as she was alone, Yvonne Dorigny walked to the window to catch a glimpse of her son as he left the house. He was out in the street in a moment, raised his head and blew her a kiss, as was his custom every day. Then the governess took his hand with, as Yvonne remarked to her surprise, a movement of unusual violence. Yvonne leant further out of the window, and, when the boy reached the corner of the boulevard, she suddenly saw a man step out of a motor car and go up to him. The man, in whom she recognized Bernard, her husband's confidential servant, took the child by the arm, made both him and the governess get into the car, and ordered the chauffeur to drive off. The whole incident did not take ten seconds. Yvonne, in her trepidation, ran to her bedroom, seized a wrap, and went to the door. The door was locked, and there was no key in the lock. She hurried back to the boudoir. The door of the boudoir also was locked. Then, suddenly, the image of her husband appeared before her, that gloomy face which no smile ever lit up, those pitiless eyes in which, for years, she had felt so much hatred and malice. It's he. It's he, she said to herself. He has taken the child. Oh, it's horrible. She beat against the door with her fists, with her feet, then flew to the mantelpiece and pressed the bell fiercely. The shrill sound rang through the house from top to bottom. The servants would be sure to come. Perhaps a crowd would gather in the street. And impelled by a sort of despairing hope, she kept her finger on the button. A key turned in the lock. The door was flung wide open. The Count appeared on the threshold of the boudoir and the expression of his face was so terrible that Yvonne began to tremble. He entered the room. Five or six steps separated him from her. With a supreme effort, she tried to stir, but all movement was impossible. And when she attempted to speak, she could only flutter her lips and emit incoherent sounds. She felt herself lost. The thought of death unhinged her. Her knees gave way beneath her, and she sank into a huddled heap with a moan. The Count rushed at her and seized her by the throat. Hold your tongue! Don't call out, he said in a low voice. That will be best for you. Seeing that she was not attempting to defend herself, he loosened his hold of her and took from his pocket some strips of canvas, ready rolled and of different lengths. In a few minutes, Yvonne was lying on a sofa, with her wrists and ankles bound, and her arms fastened close to her body. It was now dark in the boudoir. The Count switched on the electric light and went to a little writing desk where Yvonne was accustomed to keep her letters. Not succeeding in opening it, he picked the lock with a bent wire, emptied the drawers, and collected all the contents into a bundle, which he carried off in a cardboard file. Waste of time, eh? He grinned. Nothing but bills and letters of no importance, no proof against you. Ta! I'll keep my son for all that and I swear before heaven that I will not let him go. As he was leaving the room, he was joined near the door by his man Bernard. The two stopped and talked in a low voice, but Yvonne heard these words spoken by the servant. I have had an answer from the working jeweler. He says he holds himself at my disposal. And the Count replied, The thing is put off until twelve o'clock midday, tomorrow. My mother has just telephoned to say that she could not come before. Then Yvonne heard the key turn in the lock and the sound of steps going down to the ground floor, where her husband's study was. She long lay inert, her brain reeling with vague, swift ideas that burnt her in passing, like flames. She remembered her husband's infamous behavior, his humiliating conduct to her, his threats, his plans for a divorce. And she gradually came to understand that she was the victim of a regular conspiracy that the servants had been sent away until the following evening by their master's orders. 
that the governess had carried off her son by the Count's instructions and with Bernard's assistance, that her son would not come back, and that she would never see him again. My son, she cried, my son. Exasperated by her grief, she stiffened herself, with every nerve, with every muscle tense to make a violent effort. And she was astonished to find that her right hand, which the Count had fastened to hurriedly, still retained a certain freedom. Then a mad hope invaded her, and slowly, patiently, she began the work of self-deliverance. It was long in the doing. She needed a deal of time to widen the knot sufficiently, and a deal of time afterward when the hand was released, to undo those other bonds which tied her arms to her body, and those which fastened her ankles. Still, the thought of her son sustained her and the last shackle fell as the clock struck eight. She was free. She was no sooner on her feet than she flew to the window and flung back the latch with the intention of calling the first passerby. At that moment a policeman came walking along the pavement. She leant out, but the brisk evening air striking her face calmed her. She thought of the scandal, of the judicial investigation, of the cross-examination, of her son, Oh, heaven, what could she do to get him back? How could she escape? The Count might appear at the least sound. And who knew but that, in a moment of fury? She shivered from head to foot, seized with a sudden terror. The horror of death mingled in her poor brain with the thought of her son, and she stammered with a choking throat, Help! Help! She stopped and said to herself several times over in a low voice, Help! Help! As though the word awakened an idea, a memory within her, and as though the hope of assistance no longer seemed to her impossible. For some minutes she remained absorbed in deep meditation, broken by fears and starts. Then, with an almost mechanical series of movements, she put out her arm to a little set of shelves, hanging over the writing desk, took down four books, one after the other turned the pages with a distraught air, replaced them, and ended by finding, between the pages of the fifth, a visiting card on which her eyes spelt the name, Horace Velmont, followed by an address written in pencil, Circle de la Rue Royale. And her memory conjured up the strange thing which that man had said to her, a few years before, in that same house, on a day when she was at home to her friends. If ever a danger threatens you, if you need help, do not hesitate. Post this card, which you see me put into this book, and, whatever the hour, whatever the obstacles, I will come. With what a curious air he had spoken these words, and how well he had conveyed the impression of certainty, of strength, of unlimited power, of indomitable daring. Abruptly, unconsciously, acting under the impulse of an irresistible determination, the consequences of which she refused to anticipate, Yvonne, with the same automatic gestures, took a pneumatic delivery envelope, slipped in the card, sealed it, directed it to Oris Velmont, Circle de la Rue Royale, and went to the open window. The policeman was walking up and down outside. She flung out the envelope, trusting to fate. Perhaps it would be picked up, treated as a lost letter, and posted. She had hardly completed this act when she realized its absurdity. It was mad to suppose that the message would reach the address and matter still to hope that the man to whom she was sending could come to her assistance. Whatever the hour, whatever the obstacles, a reaction followed, which was all the greater inasmuch as the effort had been swift and violent. Yvonne staggered, leant against a chair, and losing all energy, let herself fall. The hours passed by, the dreary hours of winter evenings, when nothing but the sound of carriages interrupts the silence of the street. The clock struck, pitilessly. In the half-sleep that numbed her limbs, Yvonne counted the strokes. She also heard certain noises on different floors of the house, which told her that her husband had dined, that he was going up to his room, that he was going down again to his study. But all this seemed very shadowy to her, and her torpor was such that she did not even think of lying down on the sofa in case he should come in. The twelve strokes of midnight, then half-past twelve, then one. Yvonne thought of nothing, awaiting the events which were preparing and against which rebellion was useless. 
She pictured her son and herself as one pictures those beings who have suffered much and who suffer no more and who take each other in their loving arms. But a nightmare shattered this dream, for now those two beings were to be torn asunder, and she had the awful feeling in her delirium that she was crying and choking. She leapt from her seat. The key had turned in the lock. The Count was coming, attracted by her cries. Yvonne glanced round for a weapon with which to defend herself, but the door was pushed back quickly and, astounded, as though the sight that presented itself before her eyes seemed to her the most inexplicable prodigy. She stammered, You! You! A man was walking up to her, in dress clothes, with his opera hat and cape under his arm. And this man, young, slender, and elegant, she had recognized as Horace Velmont. You! she repeated. He said with a bow, I beg your pardon, madam, but I did not receive your letter until very late. Is it possible? Is it possible that this is you? That you were able to... He seemed greatly surprised. Did I not promise to come in answer to your call? Yes, but... Well, here I am, he said with a smile. He examined the strips of canvas from which Yvonne had succeeded in freeing herself and nodded his head while continuing his inspection. So those are the means employed? The Comte d'Origny, I presume? I also saw that he locked you in. But then the pneumatic letter? Ah, through the window. How careless of you not to close it. He pushed both sides, too. Yvonne took fright. Suppose they hear. There is no one in the house. I have been over it. Still, your husband went out ten minutes ago. Where is he? With his mother, the Comtesse d'Origny. How do you know? Oh, it's very simple. He was rung up by telephone and I awaited the result at the corner of this street and the boulevard. As I expected, the Count came out hurriedly, followed by his man. I at once entered, with the aid of special keys. He told this in the most natural way, just as one tells a meaningless anecdote in a drawing room. But Ivan, suddenly seized with fresh alarm, asked, Then it's not true? His mother is not ill? In that case... My husband will be coming back. Certainly the Count will see that a trick has been played on him, and in three quarters of an hour, at the latest, let us go. I don't want him to find me here. I must go to my son. One moment. One moment. But don't you know that they have taken him from me? That they are hurting him, perhaps? With set face and feverish gestures, she tried to push Velmont back. He, with great gentleness, compelled her to sit down and, leaning over her in a respectful attitude, said, in a serious voice, Listen, madame, and let us not waste time when every minute is valuable. First of all, remember this. We met four times, six years ago, and on the fourth occasion, when I was speaking to you. In the drawing room of this house, with too much, what shall I say, with too much feeling, you gave me to understand that my visits were no longer welcome. Since that day I have not seen you, and nevertheless, in spite of all, your faith in me was such that you kept the card which I put between the pages of that book, and six years later, you send for me and none other. That faith in me I ask you to continue. You must obey me blindly, just as I surmounted every obstacle to come to you so I will save you, whatever the position may be. Horace Velmont's Calmness his masterful voice with the friendly intonation gradually quieted the countess. Though still very weak, she gained a fresh sense of ease and security in that man's presence. Have no fear, he went on. The Comtesse d'Origny lives at the other end of the Bois de Vincennes. Allowing that your husband finds a motor cab, it is impossible for him to be back before a quarter past three. Well, it is twenty-five to three now. I swear to take you away at three o'clock exactly, and to take you to your son. But I will not go before I know everything. What am I to do? she asked. Answer me, and very plainly. We have twenty minutes. It is enough, but it is not too much. Ask me what you want to know. Do you think that the Count had any, any murderous intentions? No. Then it concerns your son? Yes. He is taking him away, I suppose, because he wants to divorce you and marry another woman, a former friend of yours, whom you have turned out of your house. Is that it? 
Oh, I entreat you, answer me frankly. These are facts of public notoriety, and your hesitation, your scruples must all cease, now that the matter concerns your son. So your husband wished to marry another woman? Yes. The woman has no money. Your husband, on his side, has gambled away all his property, and has no means beyond the allowance which he receives from his mother, the Comtesse d'Origny, and the income of a large fortune which your son inherited from two of your uncles. It is this fortune which your husband covets, and which he would appropriate more easily if the child were placed in his hands. There is only one way. Divorce. Am I right? Yes. And what has prevented him until now is your refusal? Yes, mine and that of my mother-in-law, whose religious feelings are opposed to divorce. The Comtesse d'Origny would only yield in case— In case? In case they could prove me guilty of shameful conduct. Velmont shrugged his shoulders. Therefore, he is powerless to do anything against you or against your son, both from the legal point of view and from that of his own interests. He stumbles against an obstacle, which is the most insurmountable of all, the virtue of an honest woman. And yet, in spite of everything, he suddenly shows fight. What do you mean? I mean that if a man like the Count, after so many hesitations and in the face of so many difficulties, risks so doubtful an adventure, it must be because he thinks he has command of weapons. What weapons? I don't know. But they exist, or else he would not have begun by taking away your son. Yvonne gave way to her despair. Oh, this is horrible. How do I know what he may have done, what he may have invented? Try and think. Recall your memories. Tell me, in this desk which he has broken open, was there any sort of letter which he could possibly turn against you? No, only bills and addresses. And, in the words he used to you, in his threats, is there nothing that allows you to guess? Nothing. Still, still, Belmont insisted, there must be something. And he continued, Has the Count a particularly intimate friend, in whom he confides? No. Did anybody come to see him yesterday? No, nobody. Was he alone when he bound you and locked you in? At that moment, yes. But afterward, his man Bernard joined him near the door and I heard them talking about a working jeweler. Is that all? And about something that was to happen the next day, that is, today, at twelve o'clock, because the Comtesse d'Origny could not come earlier. Velmont reflected. Has that conversation any meaning that throws a light upon your husband's plans? I don't see any. Where are your jewels? My husband has sold them all. You have nothing at all left? No. Not even a ring? No, she said, showing her hands. None except this. Which is your wedding ring? Which is my wedding? She stopped, nonplussed. Velmont saw her flush as she stammered. Could it be possible? But no, no, he doesn't know. Velmont at once pressed her with questions, and Yvonne stood silent, motionless, anxious-faced. At last she replied in a low voice, This is not my wedding ring. One day, long ago, it dropped from the mantelpiece in my bedroom, where I had put it a minute before, and, hunt for it as I might, I could not find it again. So I ordered another, without saying anything about it, and this is the one on my hand. Did the real ring bear the date of your wedding? Yes, the 23rd of October. And the second? This one has no date. He perceived a slight hesitation in her and a confusion which, in point of fact, she did not try to conceal. I implore you, he exclaimed, don't hide anything from me. You see how far we have gone in a few minutes, with a little logic and calmness. Let us go on, I ask you as a favor. Are you sure, she said, that it is necessary? I am sure that the least detail is of importance and that we are nearly attaining our object, but we must hurry. This is a crucial moment. I have nothing to conceal, she said, proudly raising her head. It was the most wretched and the most dangerous period of my life. While suffering humiliation at home, outside, I was surrounded with attentions, with temptations, with pitfalls, like any woman who is seen to be neglected by her husband. Then I remembered. Before my marriage, a man had been in love with me. 
I had guessed his unspoken love, and he has died since. I had the name of that man engraved inside the ring, and I wore it as a talisman. There was no love in me, because I was the wife of another. But in my secret heart there was a memory, a sad dream, something sweet and gentle that protected me. She had spoken slowly, without embarrassment, and Velmont did not doubt for a second that she was telling the absolute truth. He kept silent, and she, becoming anxious again, asked, Do you suppose that my husband... He took her hand and, while examining the plain gold ring, said, The puzzle lies here. Your husband, I don't know how, knows of the substitution of one ring for the other. His mother will be here at twelve o'clock. In the presence of witnesses, he will compel you to take off your ring. And in this way, he will obtain the approval of his mother and, at the same time, will be able to obtain his divorce because he will have the proof for which he was seeking. I am lost, she moaned. I am lost. On the contrary, you are saved. Give me that ring. And presently he will find another there, another which I will send you to reach you before twelve, and which will bear the date of the twenty-third of October. So, he suddenly broke off. While he was speaking, Yvonne's hand had turned ice cold in his. And raising his eyes, he saw that the young woman was pale, terribly pale. What's the matter, I beseech you? She yielded to a fit of mad despair. This is the matter, that I am lost. This is the matter, that I can't get the ring off. It has grown too small for me. Do you understand? It made no difference, and I did not give it a thought. But today, this proof, this accusation, oh, what torture. Look, it forms part of my finger. It has grown into my flesh, and I can't. I can't. She pulled at the ring, vainly, with all her might, at the risk of injuring herself. But the flesh swelled up around the ring, and the ring did not budge. Oh, she cried, seized with an idea that terrified her. I remember, the other night, a nightmare I had. It seemed to me that someone entered my room and caught hold of my hand. And I could not wake up. It was he. It was he. He had put me to sleep, I was sure of it. And he was looking at the ring. And presently he will pull it off before his mother's eyes. Ah, I understand everything. That working jeweler. He will cut it from my hand tomorrow. You see. You see, I am lost. She hid her face in her hands and began to weep. But amid the silence, the clock struck once and twice, and yet once more. And Yvonne drew herself up with a jerk. There he is, she cried. He is coming. It is three o'clock. Let us go. She grabbed at her cloak and ran to the door. Velmont barred the way and, in a masterful tone, You shall not go. My son, I want to see him to take him back. You don't even know where he is. I want to go. You shall not go. <laughs> it would be madness. He took her by the wrists. She tried to release herself, and Velmont had to employ a little force to overcome her resistance. In the end, he succeeded in getting her back to the sofa, then in laying her at full length and at once, without heeding her lamentations. He took the canvas strips and fastened her wrists and ankles. Yes, he said, it would be madness. Who would have set you free? Who would have opened that door for you? An accomplice. What an argument against you, and what a pretty use your husband would make of it with his mother. And besides, what's the good? To run away means accepting divorce. And what might that not lead to? You must stay here. She sobbed, I'm frightened, I'm frightened. This ring burns me. Break it. Take it away. Don't let him find it. And if it is not found on your finger, who will have broken it? Again, an accomplice. No, you must face the music. And face it boldly. For I answer for everything. Believe me. I answer for everything. If I have to tackle the Comtesse d'Origny bodily, and thus delay the interview. If I had to come myself before noon... It is the real wedding ring that shall be taken from your finger, that I swear, 
and your son shall be restored to you. Swayed and subdued, Yvonne instinctively held out her hands to the bonds. When he stood up, she was bound as she had been before. He looked round the room to make sure that no trace of his visit remained. Then he stooped over the countess again and whispered, Think of your son, and whatever happens, fear nothing. I am watching over you. She heard him open and shut the door of the boudoir and, a few minutes later, the hall door. At half past three, a motor cab drew up. The door downstairs was slammed again, and almost immediately after, Yvonne saw her husband hurry in, with a furious look in his eyes. He ran up to her, felt to see if she was still fastened, and snatching her hand, examined the ring. Yvonne fainted. She could not tell when she woke how long she had slept, but the broad light of day was filling the boudoir, and she perceived at the first movement which she made that her bonds were cut. Then she turned her head and saw her husband standing beside her, looking at her. My son, my son, she moaned. I want my son. He replied in a voice of which she felt the jeering insolence. Our son is in a safe place, and for the moment, it's a question not of him, but of you. We are face to face with each other, probably for the last time, and the explanation between us will be a very serious one. I must warn you that it will take place before my mother. Have you any objection? Yvonne tried to hide her agitation and answered, None at all. Can I send for her? Yes, leave me in the meantime. I shall be ready when she comes. My mother is here. Your mother is here? cried Yvonne in dismay, remembering Horace Velmont's promise. What is there to astonish you in that? And is it now? Is it at once that you want to? Yes. Why? Why not this evening? Why not tomorrow? Today and now, declared the Count. A rather curious incident happened in the course of last night, an incident which I cannot account for, and which decided me to hasten the explanation. Don't you want something to eat first? No. No. Then I will go and fetch my mother. He turned to Yvonne's bedroom. Yvonne glanced at the clock. It marked twenty-five minutes to eleven. Ah, she said with a shiver of fright. Twenty-five minutes to eleven. Oris Velmont would not save her and nobody in the world and nothing in the world would save her. For there was no miracle that could place the wedding ring upon her finger. The Count returning with the Comtesse d'Origny, asked her to sit down. She was a tall, lank, angular woman, who had always displayed a hostile feeling to Yvonne. She did not even bid her daughter-in-law good morning, showing that her mind was made up as regards the accusation. I don't think, she said, that we need speak at length. In two words, my son maintains. I don't maintain, mother, said the Count, I declare. I declare on my oath that three months ago, during the holidays, the upholsterer, when laying the carpet in this room and the boudoir, found the wedding ring which I gave my wife lying in a crack in the floor. Here is the ring. The date of the 23rd of October is engraved inside. Then, said the Countess, the ring which your wife carries. That is another ring, which she ordered in exchange for the real one. Acting on my instructions, Bernard, my man, after long searching, ended by discovering in the outskirts of Paris, where he now lives, the little jeweler to whom she went. This man remembers perfectly, and is willing to bear witness, that his customer did not tell him to engrave a date, but a name. He has forgotten the name, but the man who used to work with him in his shop may be able to remember it. This working jeweler has been informed by letter that I required his services and he replied yesterday, placing himself at my disposal. Bernard went to fetch him at nine o'clock this morning. They are both waiting in my study. He turned to his wife. Will you give me that ring of your own free will? You know, she said, from the other night, that it won't come off my finger. In that case, can I have the man up? He has the necessary implements with him. Yes, she said, in a voice faint as a whisper. She was resigned. She conjured up the future as in a vision, the scandal, the decree of divorce pronounced against herself, 
the custody of the child awarded to the father, and she accepted this, thinking that she would carry off her son, that she would go with him to the ends of the earth, and that the two of them would live alone together and happy. Her mother-in-law said, You have been very thoughtless, Yvonne. Yvonne was on the point of confessing to her and asking for her protection. But what was the good? How could the Comtesse Dorigny possibly believe her innocent? She made no reply. Besides, the Count at once returned, followed by his servant and by a man carrying a bag of tools under his arm. And the Count said to the man, You know what you have to do. Yes, said the workman. It's to cut a ring that's grown too small. That's easily done. A touch of the nippers. And then you will see, said the Count, if the inscription inside the ring was the one you engraved. Yvonne looked at the clock. It was ten minutes to eleven. She seemed to hear, somewhere in the house, a sound of voices raised in argument, and, in spite of herself, she felt a thrill of hope. Perhaps Velmont has succeeded. But the sound was renewed, and she perceived that it was produced by some costermongers passing under her window and moving farther on. It was all over. Horace Velmont had been unable to assist her, and she understood that, to recover her child, she must rely upon her own strength, for the promises of others are vain. She made a movement of recoil. She had felt the workman's heavy hand on her hand, and that hateful touch revolted her. The man apologized awkwardly. The Count said to his wife, You must make up your mind, you know. Then she put out her slim and trembling hand to the workman, who took it, turned it over and rested it on the table with the palm upward. Yvonne felt the cold steel. She longed to die, then and there. And at once attracted by that idea of death, she thought of the poisons which she would buy, and which would send her to sleep, almost without her knowing it. The operation did not take long. Inserted on the slant, the little steel pliers pushed back the flesh, made room for themselves, and bit the ring. A strong effort, and the ring broke. The two ends had only to be separated to remove the ring from the finger. The workman did so. The Count exclaimed in triumph, At last, now we shall see. The proof is there, and we are all witnesses. He snatched up the ring and looked at the inscription. A cry of amazement escaped him. The ring bore the date of his marriage to Yvonne. 23rd of October. We were sitting on the terrace at Monte Carlo. Lupin finished his story, lit a cigarette, and calmly puffed the smoke into the blue air. I said, Well? Well what? Why, the end of the story. The end of the story? But what other end could there be? Come, you're joking. Not at all. Isn't that enough for you? The Countess is saved. The Count not possessing the least proof against her, is compelled by his mother to forego the divorce and to give up the child. That is all. Since then, he has left his wife, who is living happily with her son, a fine lad of sixteen. Yes, yes, but the way in which the Countess was saved? Lupin burst out laughing. My dear old chap, Lupin sometimes condescends to address me in this affectionate manner. My dear old chap, you may be rather smart at relating my exploits, but by Jove, you do want to have the eyes dotted for you. I assure you the Countess did not ask for explanations. Very likely. But there's no pride about me, I added laughing. Dot those eyes for me, will you? He took out a five-franc piece and closed his hand over it. What's in my hand? A five-franc piece. He opened his hand. The five-franc piece was gone. You see how easy it is? A working jeweler, with his nippers, cuts a ring with a date engraved upon it, 23rd of October. It's a simple little trick of sleight of hand, one of many which I have in my bag. By Jove, I didn't spend six months with Dixon, the conjurer, see for nothing. But then, out with it. The working jeweler? Was Horace Velmont? Was good old Lupin? Leaving the Countess at three o'clock in the morning. I employed the few remaining minutes before the husband's return to have a look round his study. On the table I found the letter from the working jeweler. The letter gave me the address. A bribe of a few louis enabled me to take the workman's place, and I arrived with a wedding ring, ready cut and engraved. Hocus pocus. Pass. The Count couldn't make head or tail of it. 
Splendid, I cried. And I added, a little chaffingly, in my turn, but don't you think that you were humbugged a bit yourself on this occasion? Oh, and by whom, pray? By the Countess? In what way? Hang it all that name engraved as a talisman, the mysterious Adonis who loved her and suffered for her sake. All that story seems very unlikely. And I wonder whether Lupin though you be, you did not just drop upon a pretty love story, absolutely genuine and none too innocent. Lupin looked at me out of the corner of his eye. No, he said. How do you know? If the Countess made a misstatement in telling me that she knew that man before her marriage, and that he was dead, and if she really did love him in her secret heart, I at least have a positive proof that it was an ideal love, and that he did not suspect it. And where is the proof? It is inscribed inside the ring which I myself broke on the Countess's finger, and which I carry on me. Here it is. You can read the name she had engraved on it. He handed me the ring. I read, Oris Velmont. There was a moment of silence between Lupin and myself, and noticing it, I also observed on his face a certain emotion, a tinge of melancholy. I resumed, What made you tell me this story, to which you have often alluded in my presence? What made me? He drew my attention to a woman, still exceedingly handsome, who was passing on a young man's arm. She saw Lupin and bowed. It's she, he whispered. She and her son. Then she recognized you. She always recognizes me, whatever my disguise. But since the burglary at the Chateau de Tibermenil, do the police have identified the two names of Arsène Lupin and Horace Velmont? Yes. Therefore she knows who you are. Yes. And she bows to you? I exclaimed in spite of myself. He caught me by the arm and fiercely, Do you think that I am Lupin to her? Do you think that I am a burglar in her eyes, a rogue, a cheat? Why, I might be the lowest of miscreants. I might be a murderer even. And still she would bow to me. Why, because she loved you once? Rot. That would be an additional reason on the contrary, why she should now despise me. What then? I am the man who gave her back her son.